It's one of the greatest mysteries in UFO history. A well on the lonely Texas prairie and an Old West cemetery that may contain proof that we are not alone. In 1897, something allegedly crashes in Texas six years before the invention of the airplane. Someone or something is found in the wreckage. Who or what is buried in an unmarked grave? So the stone would have been you know, somewhere in this area. Crash debris is sealed in a well and remains off limits. Something moving down there. Until now. We've got an element there, but we don't know what it is. This is case number 1897-201, Aurora, Texas, first contact. On April 17, 1897, the people of Aurora, Texas look skyward to something they've never seen before, a flying machine. At 6 a.m., citizens report seeing a cigar-shaped craft traveling due north over the town. Tell me what you know about this case. This is an incredibly historical, infamous, mysterious case, one of the strangest cases in all ufology, because this case happened before there was ufology. Nobody really knows what happened. According to witnesses, the craft appears to be in trouble. It slams into a windmill on a high bluff. The collision and resulting explosion rains flaming debris over acres of land. At the site, Curious onlookers discover debris that resembles a mixture of aluminum and silver, and in the twisted wreckage, a grisly find, a diminutive and unearthly body. A local military man claims the dead pilot is a Martian. Newspaperman S.E. Hayden reports the story in the Dallas Morning News. His column includes the town people's plan to bury what they believe is an alien pilot in the local cemetery allegedly an alien was buried back in 1897. A lot of people say that there's a grave there, uh, and on the other side we have a lot of witnesses who say there isn't. So there's, there's a certain amount of confusion or disagreement. Shockingly, this isn't an isolated event. Newspapers around the country run similar stories of strange airships being sighted from California to the East Coast. Sacramento, California. Tacoma, Washington. Hastings, Nebraska, Chicago, Illinois, Springfield, Missouri, Decatur, Michigan, Waterloo, Iowa. Hundreds of sightings were claimed throughout multiple states, with 108 reported in Texas alone. Six years before the invention of the airplane, Americans are seeing something in their skies. Well, this case has been open for over 100 years. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's difficult to solve. I'm trying to figure out what's the holdup. Well, we're standing at the holdup, Pat. This is it. Every single investigation has stopped right here, right at this very spot. According to lore, the crash debris is cleared from the land, but a small portion is dumped in this abandoned well. Nearly 50 years later, People who drink from the well are stricken with a strange illness, as seen in this picture, one that misshapes and alters their bodies. In the 1950s, the well is sealed. For years, every attempt to open it is turned down by the property owners, until now. Less than three miles from the well is the Aurora Cemetery. According to local legend, and referenced in Hayden's 1897 newspaper article, somewhere amongst these graves may lie the unmarked plot of the reported alien pilot. Number one, I need to get into that graveyard and see if I could locate this mysterious grave site. 
Number two, I need to get evidence from down inside of the well and analyze soil samples and water samples to see if there's anything unusual down there. In a search for answers, Pat Uskert will investigate the mysterious well. There's really only one way to get to the bottom of this well, and that's to get down in there. Bill Burns will stay topside to collaborate with local historians and investigate the crash site. Were there any hot spots of anything that might have crashed here, anything anomalous? Dr. Ted Ackworth will move to the cemetery to try and locate the actual grave and investigate the truth behind the legendary buried alien by using ground-penetrating radar. We're trying to establish the X marks the spot for where allegedly an alien was buried. Before uncapping the well, Pat meets with the current property owner, Tim Oates. Numerous UFO researchers have attempted to validate the Aurora crash, but the Oates family has been reluctant to damage the well. UFO hunters will be the first to go inside. Now you know this is a major part of UFO history that you have here in your backyard. Yes. Can you tell me uh, uh, when exactly this thing was capped? Yes, it shows right here in 1957, so it's been sealed. We know for a fact that this thing has been sealed for over 50 years. And if we uncap this, we'll be the first people to go in. Yes. I don't believe any part of this story. It was just a good story. Like, kind of kind of like maybe a little house on the prairie. Today, some people believe the Aurora mystery is fiction, put forward by a newspaper man trying to put his town on the map. Debunkers claim there has never been any physical evidence of a crash, that the windmill the ship crashed into never existed, and the alien burial site is nothing more than rural legend. James Mars, a local UFO researcher and historian, has been investigating this case since the early 1970s. When I first went out there, nobody wanted to talk about anything. They said nothing happened. All the naysayers were saying it never happened, but because the town was dying, they needed something to come up with a story to make this town a tourist trap, and that's why Hayden wrote the article in the first place. But there may be more to this story, proof of a lineage that stretches into the modern age. May 25, 1995, an America West 757 encounters a similar cigar-shaped object with lights down the side flying over the panhandle of Texas. This is the actual air traffic control recording of America West Flight 564 from that night. Guys, 39,000, so you see something at 30,000. The length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. Uh-huh. This is not good. What, right? what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO or something. It's a Roswell crap again. May 13th, 1981. Seven witnesses report seeing a cigar-shaped ship with portholes over northern Texas. One of the witnesses reported the craft to have green and yellow pulsating lights. Another took time to sketch what he claimed to see. And of course, the April 17, 1897 Aurora sighting. We want to put the 1897 Aurora airship story into the context of all the historical airship activity in this area in the late 19th century. The first full-sized man-made airship is credited to Henri Guissard. The French engineer built a 144-foot cigar-shaped steam-powered model in 1852. Did airships look like flying saucers? They had wings, they were flying cylinders. But to travel the length of the country would have been impossible for one of these early steam-powered craft. Were the people in America seeing an advanced prototype or was it something completely otherworldly? Another key angle to the Aurora story is the legend of the alien buried in the local graveyard. Back in 73, it was obvious that there was some sort of grave there, and at that time, the little headstone was still in existence, and it was 
very unusual. And you just saw it with your own eyes? Yes, it was probably sandstone and it was only about that high. Mm -hmm. And it had a V etched into it with little circles. One side was abruptly broken off and I think there had been another portion to it. And if you extrapolate this side over to this side, you got a saucer oh. object with little portholes. Okay. 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 But it was definitely there. Why don't they exhum the right. grave? A very common practice. And then we'd know for sure what was going on. Well, a series of events happened. They didn't want anybody opening graves. They put a police guard up, yada, yada. A couple of weeks went by. The excitement died down. The very night that they pulled the police guard, the little headstone went missing and has not been seen since. Dr. Ted Ackworth and archaeologist Garth Baldwin know finding the reported gravesite is the first step in unraveling the Aurora mystery. Well, these all look like newer gravestones. We need to find the, the oldest part of the graveyard. Okay, well, they put, they're built in sections, so we probably ought to go over there to the other side of the hill. Yep, those look older. Look at this one, 1891. We're, we're getting there. Yeah. That's, uh, that's about right. This is definitely the right area of the graveyard. Why don't we set up uh, the laptop over here and see if we can match any pictures. An attempt is made to locate the missing grave using historic photos. One of the images was taken in the early 1970s and shows the actual headstone. The other is from a film shot in the early 1990s of an eyewitness kneeling where the marker once stood. We have uh, features in our photographs that can, should be able to establish some basic reference points, and from there we can triangulate uh, the, the position. Do you think that's the gravestone next I to it? This, that's the Bledsoe uh, marker. This part of the cemetery fits really well with the story about the pilot being buried in about 1897. There's grave markers in and around us that are 1897, but there's no grave markers within about 15 or 20 feet of the location where supposedly the pilot was buried. So we have a big blank spot, but all around it are markers that are dated at 1897, 1885, 1894. So it all relatively fits this space. Ted and Garth scrutinize the photographs. Then, success. They think they found the exact position where they were taken. Let's get out the markers and the line and see if we can establish one of the, the vectors out of these frames. Okay. Let's start with that, the plaque as our first reference point. So you can walk out, mark, tag that, and start the line. With one line on the ground, Ted and Garth turn to another photograph to get a slightly different angle. The perspective is that we're looking underneath. So we're definitely behind this back here. See, from here, we're now looking underneath this limb. I think this is about it here. That's our spot right there. Let's take a look here. All right, we're ready for the GPR. With the location marked, Ted will return with 21st century radar that may reveal proof of a 19th century alien contact. April 17, 1897, people in the small town of Aurora, Texas, find themselves involved in one of America's first reported UFO cases. According to local reporter S.E. Hayden, a cigar-shaped airship struck a windmill and burst into flames, scattering debris over acres. Bill Burns brings archaeologist Garth Baldwin to the alleged crash site. Current property owner Tim Oates meets the investigators with something strange found by his son. Well, I brought out some metal that my son Dylan found melted on the rocks under the dirt. Tell me, where did he exactly did he find it? Right here. Here? Why here? The story was that hit a windmill, mm -hmm. come down and packed it to the ground, sprayed up and hit that tree right here in the background. If you Is that because like one side of it looks dead, like those branches are dead over there? And discolored. Tim handed over to us some pieces of metal that his son Dylan found and found melted in the very area 
that Tim said he had heard when he was a child was the place where the object hit. It's definitely molten, it's been melted. It, uh, it looks a bit like aluminum. Surprisingly, S.E. Hayden's newspaper article reporting the crash in 1897 claims the airship was built of an unknown metal resembling a mixture of silver and aluminum. It's kind of heavy. It's a bit heavy for aluminum. Aluminum you think is a little lighter, and mm -hmm. especially when it's that thin and small. According to the legend, this is where the crash site is. The artifacts that are here represent the period of time when that was to take place up to the modern period. So if, if those artifacts exist out here, this is where they should be. Well, the metal detector should help us find any metal from the windmill or, or any of the historic activities that were out here and maybe identify some, uh, some of the stuff that's in the ground. There's a big one. If we uh, dig some shovel probes, we'll identify some locations. We'll dig some shovel probes. We'll screen the dirt, see what we come out with. According to the 1897 newspaper article, the craft, quote, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill. In fact, local records prove that a Judge J.S. Proctor did own the property. There's quite a bit of stuff. There's a bunch of flags. I think we got a, we got a good, uh, a good uh, scan of the area. We can uh, start digging some holes, grab a shovel and screen. Surveyors' documents from the era show little detail and no structures appear to be built on Judge Proctor's land. Any indication of a windmill is conspicuously absent. Many skeptics point to the non-existent windmill, a key element to the crash story, as proof of a hoax. Square nail. That comes before the turn of the last century, so before the turn of the 1900s. So if we're finding nails from the 1890s, it means that something that hit this place in 1897 might still be here. According to local legend, Judge Proctor eventually cleared his land of crash debris. No records indicate where the majority of the debris was taken, but a portion was reportedly dumped into the abandoned well. Despite their best efforts, everything Bill and Garth find can be explained. With nothing found on the surface, the focus must now turn to the well. Tim joins Pat to begin breaking ground. Well, it's been a family mystery and town mystery here in Aurora. Now it's time to get to the bottom of it. Get to the bottom, we might as well keep digging then. Keep digging. But with the first shovels full of earth, Pat and Tim uncover a clue. One of the major debunker arguments is that an airship couldn't have gone into Judge Proctor's windmill because there never was a windmill. Looks like I got something here. Me too. Why would they put these things here for a well? Those are for windmill stand. This would be connected to a windmill? Yes. Or it may have been at one time. The tower. The, the windmill over the top of the well. Even modern windmills like the one seen here use metal stands to support and anchor the structure to the ground. Your family's been on this land since, what, 1935? Yes. Uh, do you guys remember anything about a windmill? I never seen no windmill. And my family never talked about seeing no windmill here. So your family never knew of the windmill? No, only the well. That's proof that there was a windmill here. You got four windmill stops sticking up to hold the legs on the tower. As Pat continues to uncover more clues, Ted hopes to move the investigation forward by examining the strange metal found at the site. Just upon initial uh, look on it, to me, it's, uh, it's a shiny, metallic kind of material. Uh, it's very amorphous, so it looks like perhaps it had melted at one point and then uh, hardened. Uh, and it looks like it's got a lot of contaminants on the surface and it's been, could be, have been sitting outdoors for a long time. Ted takes the metal to David Dirks in the electron microscope lab at the University of North Texas for analysis. I got the sample. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to do is put it under very high magnification and maybe find out what it's made of. For Ted, the most critical step is identifying the individual elements that make up the sample. Is it iron, zinc, or something completely unknown? the instrument will bombard the sample with x-rays. 
the elements will emit radiation, individual thumbprints that will show up on the graph. Right away we could tell this was aluminum. Uh, that's the highest peak, it's the primary component of, of the sample. Uh, that's open and shut case, we've got aluminum here. The additional bars on the graph represent additional trace elements in the sample. But the test reveals something unexpected. What's that one, that larger peak? Maybe we discovered a brand new element. Could it be contaminants on the surface? Like say we had a piece of aluminum that was heated, cooled, and left out for 100 years. Could we have uh, picked up contaminants from the soil? Even if we did, it should correspond to some element that we could match here. So we're getting a, a peak and we can't identify what it is. Not for sure. No. That's interesting. An unknown element would lend credence to the theory that the sample is extraterrestrial. We've got an element there, but we don't know what it is. Uh, we have to do some further analysis. With one mystery deepening, another is about to be uncovered. Pat has called on well digger Jerry Browning to remove the historic well house. But what will they find underneath? If the well really is over 100 years old, it may have collapsed. Or Pat may prove the skeptics right if he uncovers a well dug after the 1897 crash. Jerry, what's the next move? We can't pick it up with both trucks, so we're gonna have to slide in here with the forks and see if we can help it pick it up. Let's get to it. right now isn't lifting it, it's actually shifting it to the side, away from the well, so that's what they want to do. This, this thing is more of a beast than they thought, it's much heavier than they anticipated. Finally, the well is revealed and appears to be in good condition. And at the bottom, somewhere in the darkness, could lie the answer to one of the oldest UFO mysteries on the books. Well, we've definitely got ourselves a well here. It's almost too perfect. So Garth, looking at this, one of the big stories of the debunkers, they say this well wasn't even around, couldn't have been built as early as the 1897. What do you think? Well, it looks pretty consistent to me. The limestone has got tool marks on it from a pick, so it wasn't ground down, it wasn't drilled. The bricks are handmade, and they're, they're not wire cut. They're not made in forms either. They actually look like they're hand formed. Um, and the mortar itself uh, looks, it looks pretty consistent for, for that age. I mean, why not? It's certainly, you know, without any sort of real carbon dates, it's absolutely with, you know, within the, the technological advancement of the time. Garth concludes the well is of the proper time period but then notices something more shocking. Something moving down there. No kidding. Oh, man. Is that what I think it is? What is that? The reported 1897 airship crash in Aurora, Texas is one of the oldest and best known UFO cases. UFO hunters are now on the ground investigating key aspects of the story. The graveyard the crash site, and the recently unsealed well. There's something moving down there. No kidding. Oh, man. Is that what I think it is? It's a snake. It's a rattlesnake. What kind it of snakes is, are around here? It could be a water moccasin. Water moccasin uh, is pretty poisonous, right? Yes. So, do we have a problem? You do. While Pat figures out how to handle the snake, Bill and Garth meet with an Aurora airship mystery expert at the reported crash site. My name is Ken Cherry. I'm Texas State Director for MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. MUFON began to investigate the crash site in the early 1970s. Their team found unexplained traces of metal that appeared to have been melted. 1973, our studies indicated that there was a dispersal pattern of metals from a central point uh, all around this area and including a metal uh, signal that we had from this tree which was determined to be over a hundred years old. If Garth here who brought a metal detector ran it over the tree that something might still be there? It's very possible. Mm -hmm. 
As with the crash site before, metal is again found where none should exist. Oh my, holy mackerel. So obviously guys, we're not gonna chop down a 200 year old live oak to see if there's any faint piece of molten metal in a tree. We got the hit. So the reports were consistent. We may not know what it is, but we know something's there. Metal embedded in a tree. Oddly shaped metal ingots melted to the rocks. Bill and Garth continue to find tantalizing clues. But is it debris from a downed UFO? Pat's trek to the bottom of the well could very well provide the corroborating evidence necessary. There's been a lot of controversy around this case until now. Uh, debunkers have said that this is all just a, a folklore. We found out that there was a, a, an actual windmill because we found the structures for the windmill. And of course, we're very happy to find a beautiful 40-foot well. Folklore it has given away to fact. There was a windmill and there is a well, and there may very well be debris at the bottom of this well. But the well appears to be full of dangers. One writhes in the water below, while another has yet to be confirmed. The stories are that this water in here was contaminated, that Brawley Oates, your grandfather Tim, got sick from the water in this well. And in fact, there are even photos that exist, and we have them, of your grandfather having skin eruptions on his hands from, from the water in this well, and that's why he uh, closed it up. So it might be contaminated down there? Well, that's what one of the legends about this well said. An environmental safety expert is called in. Jim Chappelle from TAS Environmental Service. We're going to be doing standby rescue to lower you down into the hole okay. and just monitor the atmosphere, make sure you're safe, and uh, then pull you back out. Because of the risk of potential contamination from the water and soil, Pat is taking no chances. So this is the decontamination suit? Well, this is actually a chemical protective suit. Since we haven't had the water tested yet, we don't know what potential dangers are down there. So we'll have you wear this suit to protect you from the okay. chemical hazards. Yeah, a little on the uh, snug side, but I, I suppose they'll do. Okay, Jim, what's next? Primary and secondary gloves. Stand up now and put what? your arms in. Brady, we grab a harness? Oh yeah, nice and cool in here. Stretch your arm out all the way. Right through there. Okay. Do I look cool, Bill? With the suit and harness in place, Jim straps a respirator on Pat. I'm going to cover up the, the cartridges, okay. and you take a breath, and it should pull the mask tight around your face. Okay. There you go. Yeah, like a champ. Like a champ. Pat clips onto the winch and begins his descent. His first task is to remove the snake from the well. Sit down on the edge of the hole. Check your air monitor. Okay. Air monitor is good. Let us know what you see, Pat, as you go down there. Right. Yeah. I have to say this is a first for me. How are you doing with the snake, Pat? Give me a second here. Stop, I see the snake. Stop. Grab him from behind his head. Got it. I have him. Coming up. Hang on. Coming up. up. Hang on to him. You got him. Okay. Can you put your leg out? Which way come to me? Come to me. Come to me. Okay. You're clear. You can walk away. Okay. I'm walking Step away. back. All right. Show the guy. What is it? Uh, who's our snake expert here? Yeah, it's a rat. It's a rat. Yeah, it's right. Okay. With the snake out of the well, Pat begins another descent. This time, he's looking for the answer to the Aurora airship mystery. Ted and archaeologist Garth Baldwin return to the graveyard with new high-tech equipment. With no permission from the town of Aurora to dig in the graveyard, Ted looks to a less invasive procedure to see beneath the earth. Ground penetrating radar expert Stan Wood and his son Robert arrive to help peer beneath the soil. 
So here's the X marks the spot. Yeah, what I would suggest is, is that we, you know, just scan the, a larger area, establish what's normal here, and then once we establish that, then we can start looking for the uh, abnormalities or the anomalies underground. Ground penetrating radar emits electromagnetic pulses into the earth. If a pulse strikes an object, it bounces back to the machine's receiver, creating an image on the display. We'll be the first people to use GPR to study what's under the ground, uh, below the X marks the spot. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll find some features under the ground that look interesting or unusual. Real consistent, cross in through here. See, there's something out in here. We'll see the changes in density from the graves and per possibly even the bone structures of, of the people who are buried there. If we find uh, basically a, a signature that looks really unusual in terms of the size of the coffin or the, even the bone structure, we'll know that something's very odd there. Are the answers to the Aurora case of 1897 hidden six feet deep in a local graveyard or in the 40-foot depths of this 100-year-old well? I hear something down there. In April of 1897, a strange cigar-shaped airship allegedly exploded in the skies over Aurora, Texas. Ted's original analysis of the metal from the crash site revealed an unknown element. He takes the sample to Dr. Tom Gray to run more advanced tests in the University of North Texas's particle accelerator. And we will bombard the sample with a beam of protons, actually. Mm -hmm and it will cause the atoms in the sample to radiate their characteristic energies. Mm -hmm. is, there any, is there any chance there are elements in there that we haven't seen before? Uh, that would be exciting indeed. The test should be able to identify all of the trace elements within the sample. And we can, we can take the results from the test, take the raw data and compare that to a library of over 60,000 uh, known uh, formulations, right, of right. matter, and, and see if it matches up any of those. And if it doesn't, we've got something new. Yeah. If it does, we know it was. Okay, well, the target's in position. Protons from the particle accelerator bombard the sample. The computer graphs all of the elements present in the metal. Tom, w what are we looking at here? This is clearly an aluminum sample. So we have aluminum, obviously. But what about the unknown element found in earlier tests? This spectroscopy equipment is far more sophisticated than the first machine and is able to identify every element in the sample. Clearly, the majority of the sample is aluminum. Are you seeing anything here that is unusual? There seems to be a significant amount of iron in this sample. For Ted and Tom, the high iron content opens another mystery one that lends credence to the alleged UFO crash. Whenever you buy aluminum uh, for manufacturing purposes, it's always an alloy of aluminum, which means it's aluminum, the element aluminum is the primary component, but there are multiple other elements which make it more manufacturable. I look down through the uh, modern alloys of aluminum, they all contain iron, but it's in small, much smaller amounts than we see in this sample. Could this aluminum be from a craft that crashed in the 1890s? Aluminum processing had a number of breakthroughs in the mid-1880s. Still, by the time of the crash, the metal remained rare and very expensive. While we can't prove that our sample is back from the 1900s, we have a definitive evidence here that it does not match any of the current alloys from today. Right. Back at the well, an attempt is being made to recover samples from 40 feet below the surface. But the weather on this warm summer afternoon has turned. Pat, lowered to the bottom by a winch and cable, has no time to waste. We just had a major lightning strike here, and the wind is whipping everything. Pat's got to get the samples, load whatever he can into that case, and get out of here because this storm is closing in and we are in for a Texas Whopper. Yeah, look for metal, if there's any metal. Okay, I'm right. Lower, give me some slack. Okay, we're looking at some roots down here. Anything metallic? 
the storm has complicated the search. You're attached to a metal cable suspended by an aluminum tripod, and there's lightning. And you're in the water. Give me a second. I just need to get a good flow. The syrupy mud down here. Load up that cooler with whatever's down at the bottom of that. We'll take a look at it when we get up here. Say. It was dark. I was standing about half a foot of mud. Water was up to here. You could tell from the suit. Uh, I saw a lot of rock. Yeah. Saw a lot of mud. Any metal? Uh, I, I won't know. We don't know. I took samples. I took soil samples. Okay. Uh, water samples. We'll have to test that, and we'll have to sift through uh, what we got and see if there's any debris. Despite the danger, Pat has collected several samples from the bottom of the well. I've got the water samples, the soil samples, and the debris. Now we hand it off to Ted, and we'll see what the science tells us. I've just had a chance to look at the samples that Pat pulled up from the well. And it, you know, upon an initial inspection, they look like more or less what you'd expect. I was not able to find any pieces of aluminum. Um, you know, there might be some very microscopic scale uh, aluminum down there, but upon uh, just basic visual inspection, there's clearly nothing uh, unusual. What I need to do next is analyze the soil and the sample more closely. Ted's additional tests will finally prove if the well is contaminated. And if so, could it be responsible for Brawley Oates' strange and disfiguring illness? The uncapped well, reportedly filled with pieces from a crashed UFO, has yielded several samples of debris, water, and soil. But no pieces of metal are visible in the debris. The water and soil samples may still hold the answer to Brawley Oates' disfiguring ailment. Ted pushes forward with additional tests. Brenda Wiles of Talum Incorporated tests water and soil samples for government agencies and industry. Basically, most of what we found was uh, minerals yeah. that would have been found uh, normally in groundwater and soil. The only unusual thing that we found was a rather high level of aluminum. In aluminum, the really? Yes. Wow, that's that's interesting. The the story around the case here is that uh, there was an awful lot of aluminum that was potentially put down into the well. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with what you're finding? Or, it's possible. It could have either been something like that or there could be a lot of aluminum naturally present in the minerals right. at the site. It's still strange to me that we keep finding aluminum in this case. It's melted uh, on the ground around the area that's the alleged crash site. We have high concentrations of aluminum down inside the well. You add this all together and to me it's possibly consistent that there could have been some sort of aluminum manufactured craft that crash in the area. If there was a crash, why was no debris found in the well? Bill turns to someone who may provide additional information. For the first time, Bill Oates, Brawley Oates's son, agrees to a television interview. Now the legend goes that because the water was contaminated, your father got lesions on his hands and everything else from contaminated water from some kind of alien metal in that. I don't have anything, and I drank some of the same water. Okay. I think it was probably due to uric acid or the gout and rheumatoid arthritis. Bill's interview casts doubt on an extraterrestrial cause to Brawley Oates's sickness. But he also sheds light on why nothing was found at the bottom of the well. Oh, so your father knew there was something in the well that was strange? No. Uh, he didn't actually know if there was anything strange, and he just wanted to clean it out. Oh, I see. So he could I see. have a clear drinking water. So this wasn't in response to any legends or no. stories. This was in response to, I just moved onto the property. I want to make sure the well is clean. That's correct. So let me get some folks down and help clean it out. That's correct. So were you here that day? Uh, yes. Uh, do you know how much metal they got out? No, I don't. But the fact is, you do remember that there was something in the well some strange metal. 
They say they took the metal out of there, yes. So if the water was healthy to drink, why was the well sealed? Our lines just corroded up, and we thought the well was dry, so we drilled a new one. The, uh, the cast iron pipe that was in there uh, had corroded? It corroded up. Couldn't pull any water through it. Here's the big thing. For all the debunkers out there, even though we've shown the well water wasn't contaminated, even though we've shown the reason that Brawley capped the well was because the pipes had corroded and the well had gone dry, what we really showed was that when Brawley Oates bought the property and moved here, there really were metallic objects at the bottom of that well. So yes, there was metal at the bottom of Brawley Oates well right beneath where whatever hit that windmill exploded. With new information on the mysterious well, Ted closes in on the final piece of the Aurora puzzle, the alleged alien grave. With ground-penetrating radar, he has the ability to peer below the surface. For the first time since the 1890s, the truth will be known. Is something really buried in this unmarked plot? Let's keep an eye on this area here. Do you see anything? See, so there's something out in here. With each pass, the radar records areas where the soil has been disturbed. Ted marks the hits with orange flags. Now these markers are beginning to take a familiar form. It's amazing, we've got a, a length that's uh, about six feet. The ground penetrating images are conclusive. An outline emerges of a roughly six foot by two and a half foot patch. Consistent with the typical grave that we would see. Yeah, and look at the orientation. The disturbance seems to line up with other graves and markers in the cemetery. It lines up with the, the, the ends of the plot. It's in a good line with that, and it's in a perfect line straight all the way through here. So the stone would have been you know, somewhere in this area, which is, which is within a few feet of our estimate. We've proven there's a grave there where, where there was a lot of doubt. Uh, of course, now we can't go into the grave. We can't dig it up. Having worked in a few cemeteries, um, it's not unusual to, have, to see an unmarked grave. It's actually expected, but this one's in the center of a location where there isn't supposed to be one, and with all the stories flying around, it is kind of interesting. The images also show the grave has collapsed due to the unstable and sandy soil. Something may still be buried in the grave, but it's beyond what the radar can detect. I'm not sure if the mystery will ever be completely solved. All we know now is there is a grave where there was a lot of question, uh, and it's consistent with the story, uh, and uh, the dimensions and orientation are consistent with a grave of that era. I mean, debunkers have all said that there was nothing to this, that there was no well, that there was no windmill, that there was no uh, body in a graveyard. What we found out is that uh, you can't dismiss a story like this without doing your homework. We reached back a hundred years to identify what that UFO was. We brought it into the present and we found a missing person's case from an airship accident. That's what we found. That's my theory. Now, I can't say that these things prove that a crash occurred at Aurora, but they do show that there are hard facts beneath this case. And that will always leave a sort of lingering doubt in my mind about what really happened here. For the first time, new evidence has been recovered in a 110-year-old UFO cold case mystery. Where many assumed a hoax, UFO hunters have found startling facts. Still, the Aurora airship mystery remains one of the strangest. An unidentified flying object reportedly seen years before the invention of the airplane.